Phil, for a far too kind introduction. Uh, we've just had a moving memorial tribute to John Feely, and memorial tributes are there to celebrate the life of the individual, not to mourn his death. I'm not here to mourn the death of clinical pharmacology. Far from it. It's not dead, it's not even moribund. It's alive and kicking, and I hope to convince you that it has a strong future. Uh, those, incidentally, are my potential conflicts of interest listed there. And it's been said that the British Pharmacological Society has made Eeyore look optimistic in the last few years. Well, I thought we needed an earthquake. What I didn't know was how to make the earth move for clinical pharmacology. But as it turns out over the last four years, we have had an earthquake, and the earth is still moving and trembling somewhat, and there is more to do, but the earth trembles have shaken up the whole subject, I think, and have led to great advances. This is a picture from last year. I wasn't there, unfortunately. As you all know, I was ill in the John Radcliffe Hospital, but we had a debate about the future of clinical pharmacology. And there's the result of the debate. Is clinical pharmacology too young to die? And 70%, you can see number two, thought that clinical pharmacology has no future. I think that kind of pessimism is bad for the subject. It is self-destructive. The pessimism of the consultants filters down to the junior trainees, the pessimism of the trainees filters down to the medical students. And unless we are upbeat and optimistic about what we do, we will destroy our own subject. So I'm here to encourage you all to be optimistic, and I think there is much to be optimistic about. I want to start with the past. And I'll start with Dioscorides. One could start in many different ways with the past, but Dioscorides published this five-volume text, which he called Perihules Iatriques, in the first century, and it's a detailed description of how to use medicines. Here's a very interesting version of it. On the far side, you see the Greek text. On this side, you see the Latin text in parallel. I don't know if you can see the translation at the top. The Perihules Iatriques is on the left, but on this side, you can see it says De Medica Materia, and it means about medical stuff the stuff that we prescribe, the medicines we use. And the word medica materia, materia medica, or the term materia medica, came into the English language in the mid-17th century. And then it meant the remedial substances and preparations used in the practice of medicine, or a list of those things. About a century later, interestingly, first in Smollett's epistolary novel, Humphrey Clinker, it came to mean the branch of medicine, that deals with the origin, preparation, and uses of that list. In other words, clinical pharmacology. And coming as I do from Scotland, that's what I was taught as a medical student, materia medica. Many textbooks were written about materia medica and therapeutics. And this one at the bottom, John Mitchell Bruce's materia medica and therapeutics, was an important text. There's, I think, is that the 11th edition, I think, Bruce and Dilling by this time. And that's the textbook I used as a medical student. There's the original one that I carried around with me, 21st edition. But it was the 20th edition in 1960 that first bore the name of our subject, clinical pharmacology. That was the first textbook to bear that name. And in the same year, Desmond Lawrence, on his way there to the CSM, as was, published his textbook, also called Clinical Pharmacology. And for me, 1960 is the year in which the subject came to... Uh, had its coming of age. But there is an earlier instance of the use of the term. This is Louis Levine, a West Prussian toxicologist, born in Prussia, moved to Berlin as a young boy, trained in Berlin, had a variegated career, and became what was then known as the father of toxicology. He has a long biography, but that's the important bit. Die Nebenwirkungen der Arzneimittel. Side effects of drugs. And I don't think I need to translate the next line, Pharmacologisch Klinisches Handbuch. This is 1881. Here's the 1899 third edition. The first edition is rare, and there is the title page, just to prove that I'm not making it up. Uh, 
this is another interesting text that figures the term clinical pharmacology, this time in English. It's from an English translation of a German text, Die, Experimenta, Die Experimentelle Pharmacologie als Grundlage der Arzneibehandlung, the experimental pharmacology and the basis of therapeutics, if you like. And there's a translation in English by an American professor of pharmacology, and it's called Pharmacology, Clinical and Experimental. Not quite clinical pharmacology, but very close. That's 1914. So already people were interested in the interface between pharmacology and clinical medicine. This man, Harry Gold, and this is very much a whistle-stop tour of the subject you'll appreciate, became the first professor anywhere of clinical pharmacology. That was 1947 in Cornell. And Gold, I think, was a brilliant pharmacologist in his day. I'm only going to show you one or two examples of his work. This is a, a slide from work of his on digoxin. He worked a lot on digoxin in the 1920s and 1930s at a time when plasma concentration measurements were not yet available. That was, didn't come until 1969. And what he did was to draw a dose-response curve for the effect of digitalis uh, on the ventricular rate in atrial fibrillation using very, very simple clinical observations for a very complicated problem. And it was Gold who first elucidated some of the primary principles of pharmacokinetics in relation to dose. We always talk about people like Dominguez and TRL, John Wagner and others, but Gold was there before them talking about the pharmacokinetics of a dosage regimen and the daily excretion dose being first order, not zero order. Now here's a hero of the Pharmacological Society, John Gadam, at that time Christensen Professor of Therapeutics in Edinburgh, giving a lecture, the Walter Ernest Dixon Memorial Lecture to the Royal Society of Medicine in 1953 called Clinical Pharmacology. And he said there, that he proposed to discuss some of the clinical implications of pharmacology and decided he'd, he'd already decided to call the lecture clinical pharmacology when he found that Harry Gold had used the same words to describe the same thing. And in that paper of his, there are more dose response curves in that one paper than you will see in a year's worth of medical journals today. Very impressive. The central dogma of the dose response curve is so important. It's something we should not ever lose sight of and across a wide range of different types of drugs. Well, now, in 1958, Desmond Lawrence got together the proceedings of a symposium. 1959, they were published. And the title is interesting, Quantitative Methods in Human Pharmacology, Human Pharmacology and Therapeutics. And this was the term, interestingly, that clinical pharmacologists in the 50s seemed to be favoring slightly. I'm not sure I wasn't there, but there is a hint of this from this symposium. And here's Harry Gold, who was invited to that symposium in London. Many of you are probably familiar with, the, with Gadam's lecture. I believe your term, your term, he says, human pharmacology, and remember he was a professor of clinical pharmacology, is a better one, free of the meanings of the term clinical, which tend to identify it with the art of therapeutics, the practical care of patients. I find this a very curious statement coming from a professor of clinical pharmacology wedded to the bedside in clinical research. Uh, and, of course, the clinical pharmacologists in the UK were themselves wedded to the bedside, and I think they rightly decided to call their subject clinical pharmacology. But I will come back to this term, human pharmacology, later on. Okay, well, as I say, that's a whistle-stop tour. There's a lot more to it that I would have liked to have talked about. But now we move to the present and prescriptions in the present. Now, for me, the present begins in 1970, because that's when I first became interested in becoming a clinical pharmacologist, immediately after graduation. And what did it for me among other things, was this report from the Royal College of Physicians, which was first published in 1969 on the future of clinical pharmacology. The committee that produced this very brief report was chaired by Cyril Clark, who later went on to be president of the Royal College of Physicians. This is the 1975 amended version. I haven't been able to find a copy of the original 69 report, but it was quoted in all the uh, editorials in the journals, BMJ, Lancet, and so on. And what they said was, 
that physicians with specialist training in clinical pharmacology and therapeutics are essential, but there aren't enough of them. They do do teaching, but clinical service is important. Each regional health authority ought to establish a clinical pharmacology unit with two consultants. That happened. Each area health authority should aim to have at least one specialist. That didn't happen. But because of that regional health authority recommendation, the subject grew during the 1970s and 80s. They also said that they recommended about 100 consultant posts, and I think we probably got about 80 or 90 during the 70s and 80s. Not bad. In 1970, so about the same time, the WHO published a report on clinical pharmacology, and I read this too and was impressed and decided to become a clinical pharmacologist. And they said that we need clinical pharmacologists. And they described the functions of the clinical pharmacologist in that paper. What were the functions? Teaching, research, patient care, and providing services. What more could an academic clinician want? Everything that we do is encapsulated in those four statements. This is my mnemonic for these activities, a mnemonic that most of you will recognize. M for mentoring. Mentoring is more than teaching, but teaching is so important. R for research, C for clinical work, and P for policy. I'm going to go through these very briefly. Again, there's a whole other lecture in what we do, but we're all clinical pharmacologists. We know what we do, and I don't need to lecture this audience on the importance of clinical pharmacology. Undergraduate and postgraduate teaching, we've just had a symposium all day on prescribing. The importance of education cannot be underestimated. Here's a paper from 2006, one of the few papers in recent years that hasn't been carried out by clinical pharmacologists, although recently there have been a lot more by others, showing that doctors are not prepared for prescribing. That second bullet point down there on the right, all doctors, both consultants and new house officers, felt that the new doctor is least well prepared in basic decision skills, uh, uh, doctoring skills such as decision making, prescribing, treatment and practical skills. Human pharmacology and applied pharmacology I'll come back to this because the spectrum from one to the other, for me, is what makes clinical pharmacology, but I'll return to that later on. Clinical, well, we're all general physicians, most of us. A few of us are specialists in one field or another. Cardiology and geriatrics are the most popular. But we're all jobbing doctors, if you like, and I don't use that term in any way pejoratively. And we all provide services of one sort or another. Poisons units, for example, very important. Service to the NHS. They are the centers in the country, all run by clinical pharmacologists. We study adverse drug reactions, and we are concerned about providing information, about classifying adverse reactions, about what the evidence is, and about the causes of adverse re drug reactions and their frequency in hospitals. All very important service work for the NHS. And of course, the yellow card system, centered in the MHRA, has peripheral units that serve it as well, all run by clinical pharmacologists. And we write textbooks that advertise the information that we've gathered to the rest of the world. The policy we are very busy at not only locally for drug and therapeutics committees, local research ethics committees, but nationally on a wide variety of committees. This is from the MHRA. The chairman and the CEO are both clinical pharmacologists, and many members and chairman of other associated committees are clinical pharmacologists. Service on committees like NICE, the Scottish Medicines Consortium, and so on, even until recently, the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs, all clinical pharmacologists. I'm not going to say anything about drug development. We all know the importance of clinical pharmacology to drug development in all its phases. 
1999, that's 30 years after that initial Royal College of Physicians report, this report was published again by the Royal College of Physicians, this time under the chairmanship of John Grimley Evans, a geriatrician. Some people in this room served on the committee that wrote that report, and it reported on clinical pharmacology and therapeutics in a changing world. And what they called for was a coordinated approach to recruitment, training, and retention, and acknowledging the specialty's successes. Joint appointments between health authorities and trusts, and a clear link between NHS priorities and the appointment of consultants in clinical ph pharmacology and therapeutics. Excellent report. Suddenly, nothing happened. And for another seven years or so, we still went on wondering when there would be a revival of clinical pharmacology. We'd heard it all before, it had happened before, but nothing was happening. I'll come back to the decline of clinical pharmacology in a moment, because what happened between the late 80s when we were flourishing and the beginning of 2000 when we were clearly not is a sad story. Now in 2005, this is the third edition of this publication, Consultant Physicians Working with Patients from the Royal College of Physicians. They highlighted clinical pharmacology in an 11-page section. The same data published again in 2008 in the fourth edition. And what they said was there's a strong case to be made for having one whole time equivalent clinical pharmacologist in every large district general hospital. And the workforce requirement they calculated at 200 whole time equivalents. Remember in 69 they said 100. This latest report from the Royal College of Physicians says 200. This would be nirvana. Uh, and they list the reasons for that. I won't discuss them. They say it takes an expansion of at least 10% per annum over the next decade. And this acknowledges the shortage of trained individuals and their importance to the future use of drugs in the NHS. This forms a start to what has happened in the last four years. 2005, Royal College of Physicians report. Now, these are the developments that have happened in the last four years. I don't want you to read the words on this for the moment. What I want you to look at is the colors. The medium is the message. These are the developments during 2006, 2007, 2008. I couldn't get all the 2009 developments onto this slide. I've had to put a separate slide up of those, as, I'll, as you'll see in a moment. The white boxes are what we have been doing, publishing papers, giving lectures, pronouncing that there is a problem with prescribing, there is a problem with education in clinical pharmacology. The blue is our Science Media Center briefing that I'll talk about in a little while. The green are meetings that we've had with other people. The orange are reports that others have issued, and the purple are funding streams. Now, you'll see during these three years that white dominates the picture. But when we come to 2009, the colors change. It's all green and orange. Other activities, people outside the British Pharmacological Society concerned about prescribing and clinical pharmacology, and I'll go through these developments with you now. So let's start at the beginning. 2006, March, Simon Maxwell and David Webb did a lot of work to look out the manpower figures, and they published an editorial in The Lancet entitled Clinical Pharmacology, Too Young to Die? Well, I'd take the question mark off that statement. Too young to die? You bet. What they showed was that during the period from 1993 to 2003, the numbers of specialists in all medical specialties had gone up by 80%. The numbers of clinical pharmacologists had gone down by about 25%. And there are the absolute numbers. We now have a total of about 7,000 consultants, of whom 53, by this calculation, are clinical pharmacologists. A sad decline, and one that generated some of the pessimism I spoke about at the beginning. But this pointed to the problem, and this was followed by a letter in The Lancet 
from those four people at the bottom there, Alistair Breckenridge, whom I'm pleased to see here, Colin Dollery, Mike Rollins, and look at the fourth signatory, not a clinical pharmacologist, not one you would suspect of co-signing a letter. Mark Walport, director of the Wellcome Trust. This letter supports the views expressed by Simon and David in their editorial and calls for collaboration to revitalize clinical pharmacology in the UK, an important letter. Because what happened after that was that we had a meeting at the Wellcome Trust later that year discussing the future of clinical pharmacology. Alistair was there, Colin was there, David Webb, myself, and Martin Wilkins, the Chief Medical Officer, and Sally Davis from the Department of Health were with us. And on the back of that discussion, the Wellcome Trust agreed to start translational medicine and therapeutics programs around the country. Four of those were funded, three of them in departments of clinical pharmacology, all four of them in collaboration with pharmaceutical companies, and all four of them led by clinical pharmacologists, an important research endeavor. We've yet to see the outcome of trainees from those programs, but I have no doubt that they will be forthcoming and well-trained in the research techniques that clinical pharmacology needs. Meanwhile, when Simon and David were writing their editorial, Simon emailed me, said, what happened to your editorial in the BMJ? Now, in 2005, the BMJ had written to me, commissioning an editorial on the future of clinical pharmacology. And John Reynolds in Oxford and I had written such an editorial and sent it in. Richard Smith refereed it, and he ticked off all the points we made. Yes, he said, I agree with that point. Yes, 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 reject. The reason for rejection was that he thought it was a case of special pleading. And this is actually a problem we have. If we as experts cannot say we think there's a problem with the area of our expertise because people think we're trying to serve ourselves, then there is a problem. And in any area of expertise, that must be the case. We need others to appreciate that there is a problem. And in 2009, that is precisely what has happened, I'm happy to say. Well, I put it away in a drawer. But when the Lancet editorial appeared, I thought I would recycle it. And I recycled that, edit that failed editorial as an editorial in the BJCP, editor's view, and I just called it Prescription for Better Prescribing. Pause for a press briefing. We decided we would go to the Science Media Center in mid-2006 and publicize the problems. We spoke to Fiona Fox, who runs the Science Media Center at the Royal Institution, and she said, OK, we'll call it a drugs bash. And all the science journalists came along, and we told them that prescribing was poor, that the students were not being taught enough, that they weren't being assessed hardly at all, and that they were ill-prepared for prescribing. We also told them that patients were suffering as a result, and some of the resulting headlines were rather lurid. This led to an invitation from the BMJ to write an editorial, which we did under the same title, <laughs> Prescribing the Prescription for Better Prescribing. Well, things do turn around, don't they? <laughs> And here's the editorial. Graham Henderson, my predecessor, was president. Mike Rollins and, and David Webb were my co-authors on this. And here was our prescription for prescribing. Education, special study modules, proper assessment to drive education. A national prescription form. You may have heard that in the news recently. And perhaps guidelines in computerized prescribing. We weren't sure whether they would be useful or not. Jamie Coleman, today in the prescribing symposium, made a very strong case for computerized electronic prescribing. Well, this drew a letter from Peter Rubin in the rapid, resp I'm sorry, the rapid response columns of the BMJ. And what Peter said was very interesting. He said, you didn't quote any evidence for what you said. Well, we responded, yes, we did. 
We cited the evidence, but let's not have a, a, an argy-bargy in the columns of the BMJ. Let's sit down and talk about this. Let's have a meeting, a symposium, a review of the literature. Let's talk about this. And to his credit, he organized such a meeting. These, are, these three white boxes that have just turned up are some of the evidence that we had presented and later published in full, mostly in the British Journal of Clinical Pharmacology. I say we, the Scottish Medical Journal was uh, from um, Simon, the Aberdeen study is from James Maclay, and the big medical students study, again, from Simon Maxwell in Edinburgh. Meanwhile, I gave my Fitzpatrick lecture to the Royal College of Physicians, saying the same thing, and, as I said, Peter Rubin, to his credit, called a meeting, as we had suggested, between the GMC, the Medical Schools Council, and the BPS, and others. And at that meeting, there was full support for what we were saying. Everybody said, there is a problem. Students are not being taught enough, and so on. That led to the formation of a safe prescribing working group. And here is the membership of that group. You can see we were well represented on that group. And there were others, Medical Schools Council are there, and a variety of others, National Prescribing Centre, and so on. And this group met frequently. Simon Maxwell was the main driver from our point of view. And they published a report in late 2007 in which they recommended the following things. Firstly, input into the Department of Health's e-learning site. Secondly, a statement of competencies. Thirdly, standardization of the prescribing form. You may have heard that in the news recently. Fourthly, prescribing competence to be tested, a formal assessment. And fifthly, accessibility to students of the BNF. The first of those things has happened or is happening. The second of those things has happened. The third, you may have heard, is in the news. The fourth has been agreed by the deans of medical schools that there will be a compulsory assessment of prescribing in the final year of medical school. And the fourth, we hope to see as part of the first. In other words, that the BNF, we hope, will become part of the e-prescribing system that has been set up with the Department of Health. It's not often that a report of this sort makes recommendations that are followed through, but all of these things are, have either happened or will happen. And in mid-2008, the BPS and Department of Health agreed to collaborate on the e-prescribing system that is now called Prescribe. So that's the first of the recommendations. Here it is. Here's the website. We heard Simon Maxwell talking about it at the symposium today. It will be made free to all medical schools when it's launched, it is going to be dripped into the system. There will be a soft launch sometime towards the middle of next year, I hope. And I want to acknowledge now the financial contribution from the Department of Health and the huge support we've had from the Medical Schools Council in developing this. Next thing that happened uh, was a follow-up of the evidence that we had presented to the GMC. They said, well, you tell us that there are problems with prescribing, but you would say that, wouldn't you? You're clinical pharmacologists. They decided to do their own study, a three diverse UK medical school study. And those of you who were at the, pharma the prescribing symposium today will have heard Jan Illing present those data. So I'm not going to go into them in detail. Here is their report. It was published on the GMC's website. I haven't seen this in a refereed journal yet, but there's their conclusion. The medical students said, yeah, we're all right. We're prepared to do most things. Oh, by the way, prescribing's a problem. And this confirmed everything we had been saying in a completely independent study. Now, you'll remember that one of the, report, one of the recommendations of the Safe Prescribing Working Group was a statement of competencies. And along came a draft of Tomorrow's Doctors. I'll come back to that because that's where the statement has appeared. Okay, that's 2006, 7, and 8. 2009 is equally crowded. Prescribe was set up with the Department of Health, and an executive board has been appointed to make sure that that progresses. And we meet 
two or three times a year and talk about the development of that e-learning site. At the beginning of 2009, we decided to have another Science Media Center briefing. And this was because David Webb had been asked to give evidence to the House of Commons Health Select Committee. And when their report, Patient Safety, appeared in June of 2009, this is what they said. They said that David Webb had told them and others had told them, experts in clinical pharmacology, that there was a problem with prescribing. And at the conclusion of all their deliberations with many witnesses from clinical pharmacology, the GMC and others, they concluded that there are serious deficiencies in the undergraduate medical curriculum. These must be addressed in the next edition of Tomorrow's Doctors, which, remember, was already out for consultation in draft form. Very helpful. At the same time, this organization, Skills for Health, which is under the purview of the General Medical Council, had been asked by the Council as part of its consultation exercise on tomorrow's doctors to consult in the NHS, and that they did. And here is their report, junior doctors in the NHS, and they surveyed 230 chief execs, medical directors, and so on. Here were their comments. The main areas which caused difficulties, lack of confidence and competence in clinical decision-making, particularly prescribing, lack of basic knowledge, of pharmacology. And they said that 65% of all respondents had mentioned prescribing and used terms such as needing very urgent attention, very poor, a big issue, dreadful, appalling, insufficient knowledge of pharmacology, transcribing errors, poor handwriting, failure to stop and review prescriptions, fluid prescribing, major, major problems now appreciated by medical directors in the NHS who have not, to my knowledge, previously been very aware of the real problems that we have been talking about for a long time. And they said nearly all of respondents wanted the draft tomorrow's doctors to place more emphasis on these points. So, Lots of support from all around, and when the final version of Tomorrow's Doctors appeared, there it was, a statement about prescribing. That's a simple, single sentence in an early section of the report, but here is the exploded text on what the GMC expects medical students to know and to be skillful at. And you'll see on the right that they cite the BPS's curriculum, published in 2003, organized by Simon Maxwell and Tom Wally, and they also re uh, cite the medical schools, uh, the, um, uh, the Safe Prescribing Working Group that I talked about before. That's a very, very important advance. The medical schools, starting in 2011, 2012, are going to have to provide this education that will fill these requirements of tomorrow's doctors. We will continue to argue that they would best do that by appointing clinical pharmacologists. Another strand developed during the year completely separately. Towards the end of 2008, the Royal College of Physicians decided to form a working party under the chairmanship of Richard Horton, editor of The Lancet, to look into the matter of patients, physicians, the pharmaceutical industry, and the NHS. And this is their report published earlier this year, February 2009. In that report, they said that several witnesses had identified the role of the clinical pharmacologist in delivering the curriculum. I should say there were no clinical pharmacologists on this working party. It was a completely independent working group. And the conclusion the 42nd recommendation of this report was that the RCP, the Royal College of Physicians, should create a pharmaceutical forum. It's now called a medicines forum rather than pharmaceutical forum. And the bottom line, ways to trigger a renaissance of clinical pharmacology should be a priority for this forum. Renaissance, I would say instauration, it doesn't matter what word you use. That's what this report says. 
the Medicines Forum was indeed established and it did indeed ratify that priority as a priority of the Medicines Forum. In the wake of that, a working group was formed to look into ways in which clinical pharmacology could be further developed. And that is continuing and discussions are going on at the moment. A third strand in this year was a, 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 an initiative taken by the ABPI, the Association of the British Pharmaceutical Industry. And they went to number 10 and said, drug companies are having difficulty, the pipelines are very poor, we need clinical pharmacologists, pathologists, and toxicologists. The government said we will start an office for life sciences under the direction of Lord Drayson, the Minister for Innovation, Business and Skills. That was done, and Drayson issued a, uh, a consultation document called the Life Sciences Blueprint, which he sent to the ABPI. The ABPI got in touch with us and said, could we discuss this with them? We went to speak to them. Martin Wilkins and I went to the ABPI. We discussed the nature of the Life Sciences Blueprint, and we reported back and sent a, a response to Drayson. When the Office, of Life Sci Office for Life Sciences published its blueprint, this is what they said. The government will form a joint industry health higher education forum and the first two tasks for this forum will be to assess the curriculum for clinical pharmacology, one, and to address the skills gap in the in vivo sciences, pharmacology, etc. Furthermore, at the very bottom, money was given to the Medical Research Council to fund flagship programs for training in clinical pharmacology and pathology. Uh, these have been advertised. and the shortlisting has already taken place. These programs will commence in two centres next year, 3.7 million pound funding, and will generate, I think, 10 to 12 new posts, in, new trainees in clinical pharmacology. Whether they will create posts remains to be seen. The Office for Life Sciences also established what they have called task and finish groups. There are two of those. There's one for clinical pharmacology, chaired by John Posner, and there's one for pharmacology, chaired by Clive Page, both of them, of course, <coughs> fellows of the society. They are currently discussing what recommendations to make to the Office for Life Sciences. That will happen in January, and with the imprimatur of the office, we hope that money will be forthcoming from funding bodies to carry on the recommendations that will be made by those task and finish groups. Yesterday, Simon and I went to the Science Media Center again for another briefing to announce a prescribing, further prescribing initiative, and there are some items in today's newspapers reporting that. Now, since all this has happened, further evidence has appeared. Here's the latest evidence from Nottingham, a study of the views of consultants and specialist registrars about how well prepared for prescribing their F1 doctors are. And their conclusion is that they're not. There is still a problem. And they quote a study from English et al. carried out in Nottingham in the mid-1990s showing no change whatsoever. There is still a real problem here in the preparedness of doctors to prescribe. Earlier this year, the report from the National Patient Safety Agency highlighted medication errors, which, as you can see from the top right, are on the increase. This may just be increased reporting but I suspect there is an increased incidence as well. And at the bottom, you can see it's mostly in acute hospitals. Mostly in acute hospitals. It's interesting that general practice doesn't report very much. I can't believe that number at the bottom. I cannot believe that errors are being made to the extent that they are being made elsewhere and not being made in general practice. We're just not seeing the reports. And I think general practice is very important. Here are the incidents. Most of them are harmless, fortunately, but only 10% of all incidents are reported, say the NPSA. So you can multiply those numbers by 10, which means 1,000 cases of severe harm or death due to medication errors in the country during 2007. I expect that when next year's report comes out with the 2008 figures, these numbers may be even higher. Last week, 
we saw the emergence of this report called Equip from Tim Dorn and his colleagues in Manchester. Another study funded by the GMC in their search for further evidence about the nature of prescribing and prescribing errors in this case. And here are the results. 8.4% error rate by F1s, 10% by the F2s, perhaps, as we heard today in the symposium, because they are suddenly out on their own prescribing instead of supported. But look at the consultants, only 5.9%. Maybe experience and knowledge does help. Now, there are other possible reasons for that. Maybe they're under less stressful conditions. But when you look at the outcomes in, uh, on admission, the same pattern uh, occurs. And when you look at the outcomes during a quiet, much more quiet period when the patient isn't staying in hospital, still the same, period, stay, the same pattern appears. Consultants are better or less error prone than the, the, the less, uh, less senior staff. I think that this is suggestive that experience helps, but the rates are still too high. And this speaks to me for the need for education of undergraduates and continuing education for consultants and other staff. Here are the, the risk ratios compared with consultants. You see that the pharmacists do very well, actually, and the nurses do no worse than the consultants. And remember that the nurses get many, many more hours teaching in therapeutics in preparation to be prescribers than medical students do. And here are the recommendations from that report. One, change the environment. Very important. Environmental factors undoubtedly contribute to problems in, in prescribing. Two, education. Three, education. Four, education. Five, education. And as I've said, I, we will continue to argue that clinical pharmacologists should provide that education. Had they said no education, one might have been a little surprised. But there it is in black and white, four out of five. The other point about education here is that people say, well, stress is very important, the environment is important. Of course it is. And then they say, and education may help. What they neglect is the interaction between these two. There is very good evidence that the educated prescriber suffers less stress when stress is applied at work and copes better with that stress. Education has got to be a hugely important factor in improving this. OK, well, I promised you a bit about the future. I hope I never meet this doctor in the wards. <clears throat> what is the future holding? Well, I don't know. Prediction, they say, is very difficult, particularly of the future. That's a phrase that has been attributed variously to such eminent people as Niels Bohr, Mark Twain, and even the New York baseball catcher, Yogi Berra. Whoever said it, it's absolutely true. But I'm going to tell you what I think we should be trying to do in, in a small way. I'm not going to make extravagant predictions. These are data on manpower. Now, I showed you the manpower data that Simon and David had collected for their Lancet editorial. And they said there were 53 clinical pharmacologists in post in 2003. Well, I sat down at my desk with a piece of paper and I wrote down some names. And I thought, who do I know in Glasgow? Who do I know in Edinburgh? Who do I, all around the country? And I made up my list and I showed it to a few people. I said, have I missed anybody? Do you know any others? And they said, yeah, you've forgotten so-and-so here and there. The list came to a total of 85. 85 people whom I would consider are clinical pharmacologists. I've plotted the numbers here according to the year of first degree. First medical degree, not first clinical pharmacology experience, the first medical degree. So I'm there in the 1970s. That's when I graduated. Oh, sorry. The first three columns are retirees, but people who are still active. Alistair is in there somewhere. Colin Dollery, others. Actually, I didn't include Colin because he's in industry, and I was only interested in academic clinical pharmacology. But the 14... The 14 in those three columns, are retired. So we can take them off the list. 71. And of the rest, there are 15 or so who do not have registration with the GMC in clinical pharmacology and therapeutics. 
So although I think of them as clinical pharmacologists, they're not registered as such. So that brings us down to about 56, which is not far from the figure that Maxwell and Webb published. That's about the numbers we have. But look at what happens to the numbers from 1970 onwards. They stay stable for a decade and then decline. We know that's been happening. And there are only 39 in those four columns to the right since 1980. Now, it turns out, and I was surprised when I found this out, that there are 191 medical practitioners in the UK registered with the General Medical Council as having been trained in clinical pharmacology and therapeutics. 191. I don't know where they are. I know where some of them are. A lot more than the 56 that I mentioned before. And the, here they are, plotted by the year of their first medical degree. The three columns to the left are the retirees, 27 of them now, out of this 191. But look at how flat that distribution is. There has been no let-up in the number of trainees in clinical pharmacology and therapeutics coming through all this time, despite the fact that the number of card-carrying clinical pharmacologists, as we would recognize, has declined. What is happening here is that we are losing trainees to other disciplines because of the lack of jobs, I believe. These people are now cardiologists, geriatricians, rheumatologists, endocrinologists. They're in industry, they're in regulatory affairs. They're not in academic clinical pharmacology, I believe, because there are no jobs for them. There is still huge interest in this subject, and I'm hoping to trace some of these people and find out what they're doing, why they did CPT, and what they think of the subject. That gives me a lot of hope. So I think there is future there. There is still interest in the subject, and I think there's future. Part of the future has got to be talking to each other within the society. I was absolutely thrilled when the Council of the British Pharmacological Society spoke to me and said, would I be their nomination? for president-elect four years ago. Not only for myself, because it was a great honor, but because I was the first clinician to have been asked to fulfill this role. And it was clearly a signal from the British Pharmacological Society that clinicians and non-clinical pharmacologists need to talk to each other, get together, which has not always been the case in the past. There's huge overlap. We are all pharmacologists. How much of the areas in those peripheries there are, I don't know. This is just a picture. It's not representative of true activity. But I think we must continue this crosstalk between the two sets, between the clinical section and the others, or the basic pharmacologists and the others, whichever way you want to look at it. This collaboration, this coexistence, is hugely important, and we must continue to develop that. That is why I was delighted when this year council decided to invite Phil to be the successor to Ray Hill. And I think this boxing and coxing of a non-clinical and a clinical pharmacologist in the presidency of the society can only do good. I found it hugely beneficial as president-elect to be working with Graham Henderson, and I found it hugely beneficial as president to, be, to have the support of Ray Hill, who has been terrific as president-elect and will make an excellent president next year. What should we ourselves do as clinical pharmacologists? Well, I think we need to maintain a core of clinical pharmacology and therapeutics. I don't know how many such individuals there should be. 90, 100 maybe would be a reasonable sort of target if we could achieve that. And what should we do? Well, traditionally, departments of clinical pharmacology have always served others by training individuals who did not stay in the core. And by core, I mean academic core. We've sent clinical pharmacologists into industry, drug companies, CROs, and that's an important part of our function. And it's behind the Office for Life Science Initiative that we should do this and generate trained individuals to serve in drug companies. We have always sent individuals into regulation, and we should continue to do that as well, a hugely important function of service in regulatory authorities. And we have always trained individuals who had other specialties in mind, but who wanted 
to be exposed to research techniques. In Oxford, we've had cardiologists, nephrologists, psychiatrists, neurologists, gastroenterologists, all coming through our department and then leaving and going elsewhere to jobs in their own specialties, but carrying the knowledge of our research techniques and of clinical pharmacology with them. We should continue to do that. I think we have neglected general practice. Tom Wally wrote a paper in the British Journal of Clinical Pharmacology now 30 years ago saying there is opportunity in, in general practice. And we have neglected it. We have kept to the hospitals. It's busy in hospital. A lot of interest in hospital medicine and the science that goes on there. A lot of prescribing. But 75% of the prescribing goes on in general practice. And I'm delighted that we had a lecture today at this prescribing symposium from a clinical pharmacologist who has gone into general practice and spreading the word from Edinburgh. And we should do more of that, I think. Well, what should we ourselves do? We should continue with the mentoring, undergraduate and postgraduate teaching, obviously. We should continue with research as before. But I want to talk about, a little bit about the nature of that research. I'm not going to preach to this audience what kind of research they should do. Everybody will do their own research. But I see the, 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 the whole business of clinical pharmacology as a huge spectrum from what I've called principles to practice on the left or from bench to bedside on the right, what other people are calling translational processes, translational methods. The word translation needs a lot of deconstruction. It's not well defined currently, and a lot of people mean different things by it. But this process in clinical pharmacology goes from molecules to medicines, through molecular pharmacology, cellular and tissue pharmacology, organ pharmacology, the whole body, and even whole populations. And if we explode this even further, we get what I call human pharmacology going to applied pharmacology, the whole spectrum being clinical pharmacology. We are everywhere at every level of pharmacological expertise in relation to human beings. This is what we do. Now, this is a linear model. And the linear model of science was first developed in the wake of the Second World War by Vannevar Bush, who was invited by Theodore Roosevelt to be his scientific advisor. And he elaborated a linear model of science. And this is a linear model. This isn't actually a model of what we do. It's a list of the things we do. It is in philosophical terms, an extensional definition of clinical pharmacology. But it's not a description of what we do. I've been struggling with this, and I've started by preparing this picture, which I think begins to say what it is we actually do and how our science talks across different bits of our discipline. You have core pharmacology, top left, core applied pharmacology, top right. All the different things that those two core disciplines mean, connected by pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic studies. The bottom left, we have individual applications in clinical therapy. The bottom right, we have population applications. And hovering, and those two are connected by evidence-based medicine and how it is applied in the clinical setting. And hovering above all of this, all the bits talking to each other are biomarkers and enormously important business in drug development. So I think what we do is, as individuals, somebody does this bit, somebody does that bit, but we all cross-talk. Each bit of what we do talks to another bit and informs the other bit, and that's why we have our big winter meeting at which we can go and hear a lecture on cannabinoid receptors on one afternoon and go and hear a lecture about practical prescribing in another lecture theatre. Everything talks to each other. We are a dynamic specialty, not a linear one. And this is the way I hope that we will begin to see ourselves in developing our research. I'm going to be talking more in more detail about this in the opening lecture of World Pharma in 2010. And this is an advert for World Pharma. Uh, the British Pharmacological Society is funding at least three symposia, I think, at World Pharma. We're putting a lot of effort into making this a success. And I'd like to encourage all the members of the society to go to Copenhagen in July and take part. I should say that I get a heavy commission for this advert. 
Okay, well, back to the circular demonstration. What else should we do? This, I think, is very difficult. What about our clinical activities? Traditionally, we have done acute general medicine and toxicology. And I believe that we should continue to do those things. Those things should still be part of the general core of clinical pharmacology and therapeutics. We may be able to train others to go out into those specialties in the way that we train people to go out of the core. But we, I think, should keep these disciplines within the central core of clinical pharmacology. If we dilute ourselves, we will not survive. I do appreciate the training difficulties that attend these uh, specializations. And I think there are problems, but I think they can be overcome. And policy, of course, as before, we are hugely influential all around the country. National policy, the British National Formulary, Formulary for Children, the MHRA, NICE, Scottish Medicines Consortium, the Health Technology Assessment Program, you name it, we are there. We are drugs, drugs are us. And we should continue to do that as before. So that's my feeling about how we should develop the subject, what we should try to do very briefly. But I do want to stress what Benjamin Franklin said. He said, we must all hang together or we will assuredly hang separately. <laughs> well, I hope I've convinced you that there's much to be optimistic about and that we can make your smile despite all the pessimism that has been around. Thank you very much. <laughs>